Blepharospasm and dry eye. You know, the whole reason you guys are here is because you want to understand as much as you can about your disorder and what's the future, what's the current, and what, why you're getting the treatments that you're getting. So nobody's going to care about you as much as you care about yourself. And you want to understand your own disease so that you can understand your own treatment and help improve your treatment care. Uh, my patients tell me more often than I tell them what they need. And I like that. That makes it a lot easier for me to help them. So blepharospasm and dry eye go hand in hand. Why are tears important? Well, they bathe and protect the surface cells of the cornea. And this is a picture, a micrograph of the cornea. And you compare that to a portion of the skin. And you can see that in the skin, there's all this stuff called keratin, which is rough stuff, which is a barrier to the outside world. The cornea doesn't have that, and so it has to be bathed with water to keep it comfortable and safe. The tears are important because they bring essential nutrients to the surface cells of the eye and they take away metabolic waste. They're also important because they carry a lot of protectants, antibodies and other proteins and, and different materials that really keep the, uh, the cornea safe and uh, safe from pathogens that come in and toxins that come in. And it maintains clarity of vision. And now I want to talk a little bit about optics. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to talk about optics. But what I am going to talk about is that in order for you to have clarity of vision, your system, the optics of your eye, are designed to have cornea, water, and air. If you don't have cornea, water, and air, you cannot see properly. And let me give you an example. Let's say you go underwater. When you're underwater, you have cornea, water, but there's no air. So when you open your eyes underwater, everything's blurry. You can't see anything because the optics are designed for cornea, water, and air. And so if you put swimming goggles on, you've reestablished cornea, water, air, and now you can see. If you have no tears or poor quality tears, then you have cornea and air. And it's just like opening your eyes underwater. Everything's blurry. So an important part of the tears is to maintain clarity of vision. We've talked about why tears and the tear film that coats the eye are important. Let's take a moment to talk about the tear film itself. So here's the cornea, or the eye. And the most important part that we think is important is the water layer of the tears. It's the largest amount, and it's the powerhouse of the tear film. It's filled with all the goodies that we talked about, proteins, nutrients, healing elements, bacterial protectants, etc. There's also this mucin layer, and the mucin layer binds the tear layer to the eye. No mucin layer, the tears roll right off. So it provides an even flow of the tears and adhesion of the tears to the eye. And then there's a the lipid layer. And the lipid layer is a barrier that prevents tear evaporation. It also helps with that optical surface that we were talking about. To show you a quick example of how important the lipid layer is, is if you have two glasses of water and you put it on the kitchen counter and you put a tiny bit of oil in the top of one and come back a week later, unless you were, live in Houston where it's humid, come back a week later, the glass that has that tiny bit of oil in it will not have evaporated away. The other one will. So that lipid layer, among other reasons, is really important to stabilize the tears so they don't evaporate away really quickly. Okay, I like cartoons and I like simple explanations. So here are, is an eyeball sitting in the eyelid reservoir. And you have tear production. The tear production fills up that reservoir. And you have tear outflow. And the tear outflow drains the tears. And hopefully there's a good balance between tear production and tear outflow. If there's not, if there's no good tear outflow, the tears pour out over the eyelids. Uh, and if there's too much tear outflow, then your eyes dry. And so here's the anatomic drawing of what we're talking about. Up here in the far corner is the major gland. There are many of them, but there's the major gland that produces the water component of the tears. And it goes down across the eye and then goes out these little tear drains that we have in our eyelids and down our nose, which is why when you cry, your nose runs, because it's draining into the back of your nose, right? So that's the system. 
If you have too little production or too rapid outflow, you got a dry eye. That's pretty obvious, right? In most people who have a dry eye, they have a compensatory mechanism. The eye perceives irritation, and it makes a huge flow of other tears to wash the irritant out of the eye. I'm interested in the fact that blepharospasm patients don't seem to have that compensatory mechanism. I see very few blepharospasm patients that come in saying that their eye is chronically watering. They come in with a dry eye without that compensatory mechanism, and I don't really understand why that happens. So who's at risk for a tear film problem? Well, most of us are. It increases with environmental pollutants and irritants, decreasing androgen and estrogen ratios, and that happens to all of us. Men and women both make androgens, and as we get more mature, our androgens fall. Tear gland demise over time. Um, that means that inflammation and scarring of the eyelid margin will make you have a problem with the oil glands, and the oil glands, as I said, are really important for stabilizing the tears. And then the increasing of, um, frequency uh, throughout the country of autoimmune diseases. Most chemotherapy regimens destroy tear glands, and more than 30% of all of the medications that we are taking decrease tear production. And I've lifted, listed just a few of them here. So blood pressure medications, cholesterol, cholesterol modifying agents, anticholinergics, antidepressants, uh, things that stabilize your heart rhythms, Parkinson's disease agents, antihistamines, and many, many others. And most of the tear supplements that we use uh, have preservatives in their tear supplements, and those also decrease uh, the, the um, ability of the uh, oil glands to function. So inflammation decreases tear production. And tears then concentrated uh, because you decrease the production and those tears evaporate away. And you have a concentration of things that should be in the tears but now are much more concentrated than they should be. And that's a real problem. The other problem that we have is that if the oil doesn't come out of the eyelids and into the tear film, it becomes oxidized. And what does that mean? It becomes rancid. How many of you have an old bottle of olive oil that's been sitting on the back shelf and you open it up three years later and it doesn't taste quite right? It has oxidized, become rancid, and that's what's happening to the oil in the tear film that sits there for a long time. And that's very irritating to the eye. We call that toxic tear uh, because the tears are then uh, irritating to the surface of the eye. And the management for toxic tear is to increase supplementation so you dilute out the bad tears um, and then provide a tear supplement. Now, I want to explain to you that what you irrigate the eye out with is not the same as a tear supplement. The tear supplements are designed to bind to the surface of the eye. So if you're putting a tear supplement in your eye, all you're doing is binding those toxic tears to your eye. What you really want to do is you want to do an eye rinse first and then put in the tear supplement. So you want to be very careful. One of the things that people do is they say, let's close up the tear drain so that the few tears that you make now stay more on the eye. You want to be careful about that. You want to make sure that you've managed the possibility of, tear, of toxic tear syndrome first. Otherwise, you'll only bind those evil tears more on your eye and create an even bigger problem. So you want to make sure you manage that, what's called blepharitis or posterior lid margin disease, blepharitis or mybomitis, whatever you want to call it. You want to make sure your oil glands are well managed before you plug up the tear, the, the tear drains. So problems with the lipid layer. When you break up the lipid layer, you don't have a good smooth lipid layer because your mybomian glands, the oil glands in the eyelid aren't functioning. Then you have toxic tear, the way we talked about. You increase the tear evaporation, and you have glare or dazzle. You drive at night, and you get all this glare from oncoming lights. It's a problem because you don't have that nice lipid layer to help with the optics. All three layers of the tear film are produced by different glands um, around the eye, and all of them are uh, affected by inflammation. 
Dry eye is really a bad term because we don't necessarily mean that the eye is dry. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's problems with the oil glands, let's say. And so really dysfunctional tear syndromes is a better name. There can be too little tears, there can be unstable tears, and they can be toxic tears. And all of these things we jump, jumble together and we call dry eye. So why do we blink? We blink to lubricate the eye. The blink is like a reverse windshield wiper. It smears the tear across the eye. It clears debris from the vision, wiping and pumping. So it wipes the eye and it pumps the tears across the eye and down the tear drain. If you don't have a normal blink, you don't have a normal pump and you don't have a normal movement of tears out of the eye. It activates the release of these uh, glands in the eyelids so that you can get the oil and the water and the mucin components that is actively pumped into the tear film by the blink. So we've talked about tears. Now let's try to understand benign essential blepharospasm. And we had some conversation about this earlier already. Dry eye leads to blepharospasm. And so here is a normal eye, and here we have this irritant. I guess it's a screwdriver punk, punk, poking at the eye, and the eye blinks a few times, and when you take the screwdriver away, the eye stops blinking. In blepharospasm, we have a similar screwdriver, and it pokes in the eye. You take the screwdriver away, but the eye keeps blinking. That's blepharospasm. That's our understanding of blepharospasm. And if I've confused you about that, let me show, try to show you another way. Here's the eye, and you have an irritant, and it creates the eye blink, and then your brain says, stop blinking. In blepharospasm, the eye, any irritant uh, causes the eye to blink, and your brain is firing, and it says blink, 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 and when the irritant goes away, there's no stop to the blink. That's our current concept, or at least my current concept, to how blepharospasm is, is occurring. And what are these irritants? Well, allergens, allergic to anything in the environment, pollutants, toxins, breeze, that increases the evaporation of your tears, bright glare, that's why a lot of the uh, folks will wear sunglasses, especially those special lenses, uh, an eyelash that's rubbing on the eye, wrong spectacles, dry eye. So any of these things irritate the eye, make you blink, but you just don't stop. So we've talked about how dry eye leads to blepharospasm. Now let's talk about how blepharospasm leads to dry eye. And you're getting a sense of a cycle here, right? When you have blepharospasm, you perturb or alter the normal blink. So botulinum toxin treatments may give you an incomplete blink. We're giving you the toxin to stop that squeezing and blinking, but maybe we're doing something bad when we do that. We're not giving you a normal blink. And so it's a very difficult balance between giving you enough to take away the spasm, but allowing you to have enough blink to do all the things that the blinking should do. Eyelid inflammation will cause a stasis of the oils in the uh, eyelids and give you poor quality tears. Poor tear film mobilization. We talked about how a normal blink is required to move those tears across the eye, wash those things out of the eye, and down the tear drain. And so those two things together lead to the toxic tear syndrome we talked about. And then something called frontalis antagon antagonist blink syndrome. What is that? Well, you, sh you saw a great video earlier today about somebody who had trouble uh, closing their eyes, and so they were raising their brows and if you looked carefully, you saw that the result of raising the brows is that the eyelids didn't blink all the way down. They had sort of a this, a pseudo blink or a partial blink. And if you try to raise your brows now, those of you who are the drivers, and you say, I'm gonna raise my brows, you can't have a normal blink. And a lot of folks with blepharospasm are walking around doing this, trying to keep their eyes open. And they get what I call frontalis antagonist blink syndrome, and you can recognize it by these nice lines in the forehead. Now these folks have it, they don't have blepharospasm, but they have it because they have droopy eyelids or droopy brows or extra skin, and so they're doing this all day long, and so then they have a bad dry eye problem, and when you correct that physical problem, the droopy eyelid, the droopy brow, the droopy extra skin, that can actually help you to 
open your eyes better if you don't have blepharospasm, and of course if you do as well. But what I tell a lot of folks with blepharospasm is don't fight to keep your eyes open. Either we should be able to help you do that by whatever means, medical, um, surgical, whatever, but if you're having to fight to keep your eyes open, you're actually probably doing yourself a disservice making your eyes drier. So how do you know if you have a tear film problem? How do you know if your eye surface is contributing to your blepharospasm? Well, it's easy. You put a drop of topical anesthetic in the eye, and if your blepharospasm gets better, you heard about this earlier, then you know that that's a significant component of your blepharospasm, and you really need help managing your tear film better. And talk to your doctor about that. What kinds of things can we do to make my eye less dry, less irritated, so it's not that stimulus causing me to uh, have my blepharospasm as much? It may not be the whole answer, but it could be part of the answer. So here I'm going to try to put together what you've heard so far today uh, from all the different speakers. Various irritants in the eye, including dry eye, will cause the eye to be irritated and cause it to blink. There's inflammation, release of inflammatory mediating chemicals, and then that causes more of a dry eye problem. So you get the sense that this in itself is its own cycle. The more irritation you have, the more dry eye you have, the more dry eye, the more irritation, inflammation, and you get this cycle. That irritation, as we showed you before, leads to your brain saying, blink. So you got this cycle going on, and then with blepharospasm, it doesn't stop, it keeps going on. So you have these two different progressive cycles that lead you to blepharospasm. At least that's how I conceptualize this nonsense. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to address these different parts of the problem, and that's what you've been hearing about today. How are the different ways that we can interrupt this cycle? So the first is how do you interrupt the various irritants, including dry eye? Decrease the ocular surface irritation. And to do this, we want to improve the quality of the tears, manage the blepharitis. I find it very helpful in my practice for my patients to take oils, omega-3 oils and flaxseed oils with sulfonated proteins. Let me just say a couple words about this. If you're going to take the omega-3 oils, make sure that you're getting a good quality omega-3 oil. It doesn't have a lot of uh, PCBs and mercury in it. Of course, these come from fish. Most of them, they can come from plants, but most of them come from fish. And if you don't get a good quality one, you're giving yourself mercury poisoning and PCB poisoning, which causes all kinds of other problems. Remember, all of our fish today are contaminated with mercury. Flaxseed oil. The flaxseed oil should come as a real oil, not as a capsule. The omega-3 can come as a capsule, but the flaxseed should not. The reason why is that the flaxseed oil will dissolve the gelatin capsule. In order to give it a longer shelf life, so that the companies you know, can make their money, they make that gelatin capsule thicker. And by the time that gelatin capsule is degraded in your body, it's passed through the small intestine where it's absorbed. And so basically you're, comp you're contributing to the waste, uh, uh, the, the lipids in the waste and you're not really absorbing it. So you should be taking the real oil. To increase the absorption of both of these oils, you ought to be taking what's called a sulfonated protein. A sulfonated protein is a protein that has a special sulfonyl group on it. That's a chemical term. And here are the common proteins that have that. So egg, turkey, soy, peanut butter, uh, fish. Uh, the egg, by far, has the best sulfonated proteins in it. So if you take your oils at the same time, within 20, 30 minutes, of eating an egg, you're going to greatly increase the amount of absor absorption of those oils. Hot compresses. The benefit of hot compresses is to melt the oil that's in the eyelids so it can come out more easily. The oils, the oral oils, change the consistency of the oil the character of the oil, the hot compresses will melt the oils. Why do you want to do that? When you have a lot of inflammation in your eyelid and squeezing your eyes all the time and other things will create inflammation in the eyelids. If you have a lot of inflammation, then the oil gland opening is really small and the oils can't come out. So if you use these hot compresses, you melt the oils and it comes out more easily. There have been a lot of questions in the, uh, the literature about lipoflow. 
I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other about it. It's somewhat expensive. They say that it gives you the same benefit as you would get from the hot compresses for three months. But the study that they did, I think, didn't do the hot compresses in the most effective way. So I don't have anything against Lipiflow. Um, I think that's worth trying if you want to. But you can also do the compresses yourself. And the way you do the hot compresses is you take some source of heat. And I like to recommend a couple of cups of raw rice in a clean cotton sock. You can get 80% cotton in an athletic sock. You tie off the end with a string, cut off the excess throat in the microwave. 30 seconds to a minute and a half, depending on the wattage of your microwave, take it out. Be careful because the core rice will heat up more than the peripheral rice. So if you hold it at first, you think it's not too hot, you put it on, it gets hotter and hotter. So shake it well, put it over a hot, wet face cloth. It keeps the face, hot, wet face cloth hot longer. That's a great hot compress for 10 to 15 minutes. Also a shower. If you shower in the morning, turn the hot water up a little bit. Face the shower stream, put your hand over your nose and your mouth so you can breathe. Let that hot water beat, your, beat on your eyes for two minutes, that's a great hot compress. And it should be moist heat because that penetrates better than dry heat. Eye rinse versus tear supplements, we already talked about. The, those are different. You wanna rinse the eye before you put the tear supplement in. And you can't read this properly, perhaps, but that's our website. I have something on there called Mastering Tear Supplements. It's plasticeyesurgery.com. And I find that to be a very helpful tool. If you're looking for tier supplements, it will tell you all about the ingredients and in all the tier supplements, so you don't have to sit there and try to read the packages in the, in the uh, pharmacy. And there are different um, emollients or lubricating um, uh, materials in these different drops, and it will tell you which drops have which uh, preservatives, which ones have different emollients, and so you can say, I really like the way this drop feels. I don't have an allergy to the um, preservative, and I like this emollient, but I don't particularly like that drop because it doesn't keep me wet enough, long enough. Then you can look at other brands that might have a higher concentration of that same emollient. And again, that section on our website will help you to understand without having to look at all the packaging yourself. And another tip is buy your drops when you, when you find the drop that you really like from Amazon. It's a lot cheaper to buy in bulk from Amazon. I don't have any financial interest in Amazon. <laughs> we can't yet predict who will benefit most from which type of lubricant. You have to kind of try it yourself. Doxycycline. Doxycycline is an antibiotic, and it thins the oils. You don't take it for the antibiotic property. It thins the oils. Some steroids can be helpful sometimes in the eye to decrease the inflammation in the eyelids, those little holes for the oil glands that get a little bit bigger. And also, there, there is a role for some topical antibiotics, that is, drops that you put in your eye, because sometimes the reason those little oil glands are clogged up is that there's an overgrowth of bacteria, and it blocks those little holes. And so sometimes people find benefit with a top topical anesthetic used periodically. If you use that same antibiotic for two weeks straight, you will develop resistant bacteria. So I usually have my patients use pulse antibiotic. You use it for two, three days. Uh, it's a complicated regimen we use, but anyway, you use it in a pulse fashion. Lifestyle change. Increase humidity, avoid wind, dry, high heat, high altitude, smog, smoke, exhaust, prolonged reading, or computer use, soft contact lens wear. Eye shields or goggles are very helpful, especially at night. Tear conservation with punctal occlusion. We talked about putting those little plugs in the tear drains. Sometimes you have to close up the eye a little bit, either by dropping the upper eyelid down, raising the lower eyelid, or maybe sewing them together a little bit. Moisture chamber goggles. And I really like the scleral lenses. And the scleral lenses are contact lenses that have a fluid reservoir. They come in two flavors, super expensive and not so super expensive. The super expensive ones are the pros lens that are custom fitted and made for you. Uh, they, they're different centers that will uh, measure your eye and then send this information to Boston. They lathe it there and send it back to you and you have these custom made lenses. They're very nice, they're $8,500 a piece. And typically there's about a $2,000 uh, bill just to get the measurements. So those are fairly expensive, but you can get a pair of scleral lenses off the shelf for about $400. So if you can tolerate the ones that are off the shelf, I find those very helpful. And there's uh, no question. If you so if you can't tolerate the ones that are off the shelf, absolutely, I would say think about the pros lens. 
So there are different brands, different lines, and you really have to find somebody who specializes. You guys probably have a contact yeah, lens clinic. The University of Minnesota, we have two people who do the lenses. So he was saying at the University of Minnesota, uh, they, do, they do offer those scleral lenses that are off the shelf. And I think it's worth trying those first. So we've talked about interrupting the various irritants. Oh, I've jumped ahead of myself. And so here we're talking about decreasing inflammation. So the oral oils that we talked about not only thin the oil, but they also are anti-inflammatory. Um, there are some antibiotics that have anti-inflammatory effects. I told you about doxycycline taken by mouth. Azacite is an antibiotic drop that can actually be anti-inflammatory. You can have drops that are non-steroidal, like Motrin, Advil kinds of drops. Steroids. You have to be careful about long-term steroid use because it can increase the pressure in the eye, giving you glaucoma. It can also give you cataracts. And restasis, which is cyclosporin. Uh, I just want to say a couple words about restasis. Restasis, cyclosporin, um, does decrease inflammation. I'm not so happy about it. Uh, we know what the long-term effects are of taking cyclosporin by mouth at a higher dose. They are not spectacular. Um, and I'm not really sure that that's the best solution. Uh, so there's a new, um, there's a new anti-inflammatory, Zidra, which I think when I look at the safety profile of drugs that are like Zidra, uh, they're, I, I like those better than cyclosporin. That's my personal preference. Talk to your doctor, see what they think. But I, I find that um, I'm more comfortable with Zidra being prescribed. It's also uh, not quite as expensive, and it also doesn't, patients tell me it doesn't hurt nearly as much as the cyclosporin. So then the third thing that you want to focus on, we've talked about this cycle on the right. What about interrupting this crazy cycle on the left? So decrease the response of the brain to the ocular irritants. And one way that we've talked about um, is altering the um, neurotransmitter in the brain. And you heard a wonderful talk about those deep brain uh, stimulator potential possibilities, perhaps now, perhaps more in the future. Also, a lot of people take what, are the, what we call shack drugs. We call them shack drugs because at low levels, they are sedatives, then they're hypnotics, then they're anticonvulsants, and then they cause coma. And so many of these you've already uh, heard of, lorazepam, the benzodiazepines, uh, and a lot of blepharospasm patients take these. I remember a couple years back, maybe a decade or more ago, I was giving a lecture to a bunch of people who had Mage syndrome, and I asked, how many people have tried these? And everybody put their hands up. And I said, how many people are still taking them? And maybe 10% put their hands up. And I said, well, so most people don't find them that effective. And one of the guys who was putting his hand up said, yeah, they don't really help the blepharospasm, but they help us not care as much about it. <laughs> so behavioral training um, can help. And some of these are sensory tricks that we talked about before. But you'll find that head tilt and gaze position makes a difference. A lot of folks find that when they look up, their buffer spasm gets a lot worse. If they tip their chin up and look down, their buffer spasm is better. So you might find that particular behaviors that you do will elicit a different response in your brain. Sensory... It's another medication that some people will take um, that can decrease the responsiveness of the brain. I'm not, I'm not saying these things aren't good. I'm saying that these are some of the things that we're trying, and for some people it's very effective. I'm not finding that all blepharospasm patients respond the same way to the same treatments. Everybody's individual. And what that means to me is that this process is really multifactorial. There are multiple things that are causing the end result that looks the same. And for some people, one thing will interrupt that pattern, and for other people, it's a different thing. And you'll hear at meetings, this is what I did that solved my problem and saved my life. Well, that worked for them, but it doesn't work for everybody. Otherwise, we'd all be doing the same thing. Neuroplasticity. Uh, Dr. Harrison and I had a little conversation about this recently. 
And I think there was a, uh, a, a note from uh, Dr. Hallett in one of the new recent newsletter about neuroplasticity. And it sort of goes along the idea of altering how your brain responds to the stimulus. And I think there's a wide range of ways of thinking about altering the brain. What does neuroplasticity mean? It means changing the brain, the, the way your brain responds. A, an example might be that people, kids who have a lot of behavioral disorders, a behavioral therapist comes in and tells them, okay, do this every time you're jerking your arm. Do this kind of behavior and your situation will improve. And that's been especially helpful in kids who have educational problems early on. A more extreme example is amblyopia. If I take a kitten and I cover its eye in the first six weeks of its life, it will never see properly out of that eye. If I do the same thing to a monkey in the first six months of its life, it will never see properly out of that eye. If I do the same thing to a human child within the first six years of its life, it will never see well out of that eye. Sometimes that amblyopia is profound and you never see well out of that eye. And we say, well, that's it. The brain has established its connections and we're done. You're never going to see well out of that eye. But there are increasing number of reports of people who had amblyopia, never saw well out of their eye. Later in life, 60s, 70s, they lose their good eye and that bad eye starts functioning better. So there is the ability of the brain to change, change its responsiveness, remake connections. There's a, somebody who I think is really a behaviorist. He talks about changing your behavior and he calls it neuroplasticity. Well, I guess it is. It's on one end of the spectrum. Dr. Hallett's talking about chemical alteration. This fellow's talking about behavioral alteration. And I think it's all part of the same spectrum of management. Okay, so the last thing that we're trying to change is decrease the ability of the body to respond to the brain's misdirection. Oh, and so what I mean by that is botulinum toxin or myectomy surgery. So we take away the ability of the eyelid to actually respond to the brain stimulation. So that sort of puts together the whole concept of what, all the things you're hearing today, and I hope that's helpful. So then we end up with this slide. <laughs> and I really, I, I tried to change it last night, it was too much work to, <laughs> to change it so from greetings from Houston to greetings from Beaumont. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.